Hi, Steve here at blessedhopeforever.com. Uh, you have stumbled upon or you intentionally came to our survey in Acts. Uh, we are in the... Uh, uh, we made it quite far, in fact. Uh, I want to pick up at, uh, in chapter 17 at verse 26. I think it's remarkable in all the time that we've been involved in this survey through Acts that we have we've come so far, we've come as far as we have, and we have yet to see the modern version of the uh, what you'd call consider the gospel uh, presented to where that man has to do something in order for God to act. Uh, Quite a ways into Acts, and we've yet to see that. So we're going to pick up at verse 26. I, I think uh, this verse is often uh, misunderstood without a doubt. The major commentaries have used this verse in such a way that, that many Christians, uh, uh, they arrive at this idea of uh, sex and uh, racial discrimination. Not only is this uh, God the Lord of heaven and earth, not only is He the supplier of everything good, but He's also made of one blood all nations of men to dwell on the face of the earth. And He has determined the times before appointed the bounds of their habitation. Now that verse is almost consistently translated, at least in the older translations as though the bounds of their habita habitation are, the, are their uh, national environment. You know, like the blacks ought to stay in Africa and we, you know, super whites, well, we ought to stay here in the United States and some less uh, super whites ought to go to their place and men ought, to, men ought to just stay in their own place. You know, and it's God who's made these inferior races of, of one kind or another. And so they just ought to stay where God put them. You know, and when the Chinese come over here to, to the United States, they're violating the bounds of their habitation that God laid out for them. You know, God laid out China for Chinese, uh, Japan for Japanese, uh, the United States of America for super Christians and you know, and, and that idea gets so strong that the, that the United States is the stronghold of British Israelism. And that the, the so-called lost ten tribes of Israel are, that's us, that's the United States. I don't know if you knew that or not. Of course, I'm being sarcastic here. You know, and all of the promises of the Scriptures are for the United States. They're not for Israel. And dearly beloved, that is a total misunderstanding. The KKK uses this verse. But that isn't what the verse says. First of all, the verse says that we all came from a common heritage. The blood of man is different than any other blood. We did not know that in the 1930s. But we absolutely know it today. You know, you may make some arguments that the mentality, the intelligence quotient of this race of people is a little bit lower or a little bit higher than that race or the other. And those things may be, but we know without any question that the human is separate uh, from any other category. Human blood is the only blood that's absolutely distinguished from any other blood. The difference between the highest ape that we've ever seen, probably I guess that would include Bigfoot, and the lowest human is an immense gap, a gap based on reasoning. He gave them the earth to dwell in and he set the limits, the time limit of their dwelling on the earth. I have so many appointed years, so do you. Uh, that's the limit of their habitation. That's how many years, not the national boundaries. God could have made it so that we lived a million years, you know, but God set the limits. Why did He set those limits? Well, our text says that it was in order that they should seek after the Lord. 
Now, when you're 19 years old, uh, you know, you can run 100 miles without breathing very hard. You can eat anything that's, that's sold, basically, and, and you can feel good. You know, I eat a whole pizza, drink three, three quarts of Coke, and, and have a bag of, of potato chips at midnight, and you can sleep like a baby. I mean, who needs Christ? And if God had made it so that we were in the prime of our strength and youth for hundreds of years, it wouldn't be any drive for us to seek for something else. Now we've already been told no man seeks after God. I've really expounded on that. And that is true. But God set the limit of our time habitation in order that we might know that there's a God. I direct your attention to Romans 1, verses 18 through 20. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. When we come back to Acts in chapter 17, verse 27, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after Him and find Him, though He be not far from every one of us. Now, the verse is stronger than that. That the if there is one of the very rare Greek constructions. And what it's saying is that God did this so that absolutely men would be forced to think about God. Now, the only thing that they can do by what's made and what's done is His eternal power and Godhead. If you'll look back with me very quickly to Romans chapter 1, you can read that in the 19th verse. Because that which may be known of God, we can, we can, we can translate that. That which is known of God is manifest in them, for God showed it unto them. And there's no question in the text, but that He showed it unto them. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made both His eternal power and Godhead, that says the Greek, so that they're without excuse. Not that they understand redemption. Not that they understand the person of Jesus Christ or His value, His worth. His not that they understand His death and resurrection. Not at all. But that they know that there's a God. And that's why He did it. That they might feel after Him and find Him. Though He's not very far from every one of us. Man, this is a super sermon because we've only gone a, a couple of verses. For in Him we live and we move and we have our being. And even our poets say this, and here he quotes, he quotes him flawlessly. If you read it in the Greek, this is a precise quotation. So philosophers know. He quotes him precisely and says, not that this man is preaching the gospel, not at all, but that this man recognizes a sovereign being, a creator, if you will. It's called natural theology. You know it. You know that, even, even though you may not admit it. Folks, if you look at a leaf on a tree and you say, well, it, that came by chance. And then you look at a wristwatch and you say, you know, well, it did not come by chance. It, it absolutely required a designer. Then God says He's going to level that against you in judgment. If it absolutely requires a designer to have a wristwatch, it's absolutely folly on your part to say that it doesn't require a designer to have a leaf. You know, we, we can make 10,000 wristwatches or more, I don't know, an hour. I don't know how many you can make. You can make a lot. You know, you, coming right down the production line. You know, they keep time with unbelievable accuracy, we, but we can't make one leaf. It's nothing but pure conceit on the part of the educated mind to say, you know, well, we must have a personal designer in the wristwatch uh, 
but we don't need one for the leaf. And I believe God's going to hold them in judgment so that they are without excuse. That's what Paul's preaching. Their poets even know this. Then we reach the conclusion, verse 29, that all of this uh, natural theology testifies that we're a race of people made by God. You have it translated there, the offspring of God. Not that we're His children, but that we're a race of people made from God, that God created us. We didn't evolve. We were created by God. Therefore, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like gold or silver or stone and these carved out by man's device and intelligence. However, there were times of this ignorance and God overlooked them. He winked at them, says the text. And, but now He commands every man everywhere to repent because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Verse 32 and when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them. Uh, Howbeit certain men clave unto him and believed, uh, among the which was, uh, well, there were mentions three others, as well as others with them. So now we have the Holy Spirit leading Paul to Corinth. There he finds a, a Jew named Achaia, Aquila, uh, whose wife is Priscilla. And, and most people, I'm sure, are aware of Aquila and Priscilla in the New Testament. We'll, we'll look a little bit more at them. They're there in Corinth because Claudius, the emperor, had commanded that all the Jews depart from Rome. Uh, that command lasted for about 12 years. And then Jews went back to Rome, but there, there was... Uh, it was not a religious command. It wasn't that the Roman Empire was engaged in some kind of vicious anti-Semitism, but because of the conflict in Judaism at, at this time. We've got to realize that most Jews had heard the gospel preached, uh, already uh, been variously estimated that by this time at least two out of three Jews had, uh, had some contact one way or another with the gospel. And there was intense persecution. We already know that Christians had been uh, driven out of Jerusalem. There, were, uh, uh, there was conflict between the Jews and other people in the area of religion and belief in God. And, and Claudius, in an, in an attempt to, to squelch any riot, you know, or defray any riots, uh, had commanded all Jews to leave. Leave Rome. Why Aquila and Priscilla settled in Corinth, we have no idea, but there they are. Uh, I think what we want to see here is that, you know, here was a Jew and his wife who were tent makers. Now, that's a relatively unusual occupation for the Jew. Uh, Jews were variously engaged in, in the money markets and being shepherds and raising cattle. This was an unusual occupation for a man whose heritage was Jewish. They were tent makers. That is, you know, not that they made the, the material, but they, they purchased raw material and, and they put together these tents. This was a trade that Paul had either picked up or he already knew. We, we know from, uh, from uh, extra biblical accounts that, you know, that Paul was a, a relatively wealthy man being a Pharisee of the Pharisees, but at some time in his life he had either had contact with this trade or he had learned it out of necessity in order to support himself once he, had, he came face to face with Jesus Christ. The indication seems to be that Paul's family life went to, to pieces after his experience on the Damascus Road. His fortune vanished. It was now necessary for him to support himself, and for one reason or another, he chose the trade of tent making. Or did he choose it? Is a question. Just like Aquila and Priscilla. We've got to bear in mind that this trade gave him the opportunity to travel, it gave him the opportunity to preach. You know, if he'd gone to work just as a normal laborer, 
it would have been difficult for him to do what he did. Apparently, he joined himself with them because they were, they were the same trade. I don't think I need to mention just how strongly I believe in God's sovereign control over our lives. There's no indication that at this time they're, they're converts to Christianity. We know, of course, from other accounts that they, they became very faithful, devoted servants of Christ. It's uh, generally conceded that the Holy Spirit sent Paul to that house in order to open their eyes, just as, as Paul's eyes had been opened on the way to Damascus. So there he lived while he was in Corinth. He went into the synagogue. He reasoned and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. Uh, and you'll note that here in Corinth, uh, there were Greeks attending the synagogue. Well, that was always true. Uh, even in Jerusalem, there were always Gentiles in the outer court. But he, of course, was not in the inner court. He was in the outer court of the synagogue. And there he reasoned every Sabbath with Jews and Greeks. You know, they could congregate in one corner or another, and he reasoned with them. When Silas and Timothy came to Macedonia, uh, Paul was, uh, if you have the authorized version, he was pressed in the Spirit. If you have almost any other translation, you'll read that he was constrained by the Word or pressed in the Word or dedicated himself fully to preaching the Word. Now, it's a little bit difficult to translate it. The Greek says that he was constrained by the Word. The, the authorized version translated it pressed in the Spirit. I think the normal translation or the normal idea is that Paul now did not uh, do much tent making as he did preaching. That he devoted himself full time to preaching. I'm not certain. It might be more likely he was constrained as he studied the Scriptures to testify to the Jews openly that Jesus of Nazareth was in fact the Messiah. But that caused some arguments. Verse 6 in the authorized version says they opposed themselves. There were great arguments among the Jews and the Greeks. And we hear that Paul shook his raiment and said, Your blood be upon your own heads. I'm clean from now on. I'll go unto the Gentiles. We know that Paul declared to the elders at Ephesus that he had preached the word without compromise and that he had faithfully presented the gospel of Jesus Christ. They've been faithfully told, from now on I will go to the Gentiles. That's what God had told him to do anyway. And it, I guess it could be well be that God put Paul through that to emphasized or to make clear to Paul that his calling was to the Greeks, to the Gentiles. That's where God had called Paul. He departs from there. He enters into another man's house, Justice, one who worshipped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. And in this house, he preached the Word. However, uh, Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord. So what had happened in his conflict with the Jews resulted in the coming of Crispus to a knowledge of his oneness with Christ. And many of the Corinthians believed and were identified or baptized. Now, it's your personal choice whether you take that baptism as a water baptism or a spirit baptism. I've spoken quite a bit on that. I, I believe the sense of the Greek is clearly that they were identified with the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't think water had anything to do with it. If you want water as part of that, that's, that's simply a sign. But what the language is saying here is that they, they not only heard and believed, but they were identified with a body of believers. Then the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. Uh, there's all kinds of opposition. Here he's, he's in a terrible city. And so the Lord encouraged him uh, by saying, I'm with you. Don't be afraid. Uh, just speak plainly. Proclaim the Word of God. I'm with you. I won't leave you. Uh, no, no man will, will hurt you. Uh, I have many people in this city. And folks, we saw that when we went through the epistle to the Corinthians, Corinth is a, is a beautiful illustration of the redemption of the believer from a filthy system, religious system, 
just as Egypt is a beautiful illustration of Israel's redemption from the world system, I have many people in this city, and First and Second Corinthians occupies a major portion of the New Testament. Uh, believers called out of sin, new creations in Christ. So Paul continued there a year and a half, teaching the Word of God among them. In First Corinthians chapter two, we read that Paul says, "I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him." Crucified, His person, His work. That's the work of Christ. The person and work of Christ. That's what He did when He taught the Word of God. The Word of God is the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. The person being His sovereign majesty and His work being His vicarious suffering in our place. That's what He taught. Paul used the Word of God. He taught the Word of God among them. He stayed in Corinth teaching the Word of God. It wasn't necessary for Paul to engage in any tremendous exercises of expansion. The Holy Spirit did all of that. He, he just faithfully taught the Word. Now verses 12-17, through 17, if you've got Schofield's Bible, you, you have some comment on... Uh, uh, Galleon's indifference. Uh, I'm, I'm, I pronounce his name like the Greek. Galleon. He was indifferent. Careless or whatever. For I will be no judge of such matters. I, I need to introduce you to, to Galleon. Galleon was Seneca's brother. Seneca was a philosopher and he and, and Seneca were relatively unhealthy kids. Uh, Galleon was proconsul of the Roman province Achaia from spring AD 52 to spring 53. That was a one year position. It wasn't a position that you served in for life like our Supreme Court justices. He was only there one year and he was finally forced to commit suicide by Nero. And so was Seneca. His brother Seneca was a philosopher. Both of those kids were, were not very healthy, but Galleon was appointed as a special friend of Claudius to be the deputy of, of Achaia. He was there for one year. And while he was there, and that's about six months after his appointment, the Jews made a charge against Paul, and they brought him before the judgment tribunal where Galleon was empowered to function as a representative of the Roman government. Now, the way this normally worked is those who made accusation would lay the charge and then the one being charged had an opportunity to uh, defend himself. And that's exactly what the text says. These people presented their charge. They obviously had a spokesman to do that. Uh, I'm going to suggest to you that the spokesman was Sosthenes, verse 17. I'm not certain of that, but I believe he was. I doubt seriously that the Sosthenes of verse 17 is the Sosthenes of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Uh, Paul the Apostle and Sosthenes brother to the believers which were at Corinth. I, I doubt that it's the same one. But no, nobody really knows. However, these Jews had a spokesman. They set up an official presentation before Galleon and they made their charge. And now Paul was about to speak. But obviously, Galleon made the right conclusion. The language is very strong. The moods are indicative. That's the mood of, insert, of certainty in the Greek. When Paul was about to open his mouth, Galleon said unto the Jews, You Jews have made a foolish charge. It has no right in Roman court. And, and it's an indicative mood. Uh, the O oh, ye Jews is a strong expression. Bear in mind that the Jews had been commanded by Claudia to leave Rome. They were, they were troublemakers, rabble-rousers. They started riots. They were and in order to ensure peace in Rome, they were commanded to leave. Not persecuted, just told to get out. Now here he is in Corinth, fresh from Rome, only been in Corinth six months, and now this same class of people come in to his tribunal and lay a charge that has that has no right to be there. It had no right to be there. 
They charged that Paul persuaded men to worship God contrary to the law. Well, that couldn't be contrary to the Roman law. That's the inference. They, they didn't say according to our law. Their inference was that it was contrary to Roman law, but it was not. So they lied, basically. Apparently, Galeon knew that because he speaks in the strongest language that absolutely your charge is not a matter of wrong. It's not a matter of a wicked crime. If it were, then I'd hear you. And verse 15 is also strong. Just as strong an expression. You look to it, for I will not be a judge in matters in which I have no authority. And I have to say that whatever the Holy Spirit has revealed here concerning Galeon is, is good, not indifferent. He, he made a wise uh, and a faithful judgment. I think that the Holy Spirit includes it here to us to show it to us that uh, show us that due, due process of law is not contrary to Christian principles. It is not. Martyrdom does not occur as a result of the laws of nations. All Christian persecution is religious, not legal. What, whatever persecution occurs in, in Russia, North Korea, China, or wherever, it occurs from atheism. Not from those civil governments, but from the, the atheistic tenets of its leaders. That could very well happen here in the United States. But it is not contrary to civil law, and I believe that's why the Holy Spirit included it. In fact, Galeon is so strong in this. In verse 16, he, he drove them from the judgment seat. Now we read in the 17th verse that immediately after that, the Greeks took Sosthenes, one of the chief rulers of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the judgment seat. Galeon didn't care for any of these things. Sosthenes was their spokesman, their representative. He's the one that presented the case, and it didn't belong there. And the judge soundly reproved him for it. And the Greeks, I'm assuming those who drove them from the judgment seat, are the ones who beat him. And Galeon did not interfere. All right, now in verse 18, we read that Paul, after this, tarried a good while. It appeared as though there was, there was an open door in Corinth. The legal system was uh, surely not against him. So he stayed there for a long time. And then he finally took leave of his brethren. He sailed to Syria, took with him Prisia and Achaia. And Paul gets a haircut. There's something about Paul taking a Jewish vow. The verse appears to say Paul having shorn his head, I guess bald, I, I don't know. He, he had a vow. Now that's a pretty bad translation because the Paul isn't there in the text. So you have a grammatical problem in the verse. It is Achaia who had the vow not Paul. Achaia shaved his head. He had a vow. I don't know what that vow was. I have no idea what his vow was at all. Maybe it was to return to Rome someday since he'd probably been asked to leave. But it was not Paul who had the vow. It was Achaia. Why did the Holy Spirit mention this? Apparently, it's, it's, a, it's an incidental piece of information that was important as the Holy Spirit led Luke to write this, and which may in fact be important to us someday when we know more than we know now. But they came to Ephesus, and there Paul left Achaia and Brasea, but he entered into the synagogue and he reasoned with the Jews. Now, we just heard him say, I go to the Gentiles, and I, and I believe he's faithful in that ministry, but the gospel was to be presented to the Jew first and then to the Gentile, not the, not the Jew first in sense of importance, like you know, Jews are more important than Gentile, but in the sense of chronology. When, it came, when he came to Ephesus, the Jews, uh, the Jews ought to hear first. 
and then the Gentiles who went into the synagogue and he reasoned with the Jews. He's always reasoning in the light of the Word of God. Take note of that. They desired him to stay longer and reason with him. Now we have an interesting Greek idiom in verse 20. He did not nod his head. It's the only place that that occurs in the New Testament. Now your translation says he consented not. That's a, that's a good translation. He did, he did not agree to stay longer because he was constrained by the Holy Spirit to go to the Gentiles, but he was faithful to what the Lord had said in presenting the truth first to the Jew, not in importance, but in chronology. Now he's in Ephesus. He, he bid them for farewell. He, he says he wants to go to Jerusalem to keep this feast. And after he's done that, he's going to return to Ephesus if the Lord wills. And so he sailed from Ephesus. And now you have an interesting expression in verse 22. When he had landed at uh, Caesarea and gone up and greeted the church, he went down to Antioch. Now, that, that is an interesting expression. You know, it, it's always true in the, in the Jews' language that, that you go up to Jerusalem. It, it doesn't matter where you are. You, you always go up to Jerusalem. You know, if you're on Mount Hermon, you go up to Jerusalem. You're always going up to Jerusalem regardless of what direction that you come from. You know, if you're in Jericho, you know, to be sure it's uphill. Jerusalem sits, I think, about 2,000 or so feet above sea level. And Jericho sits down below sea level. So you do definitely go uphill. You know, we usually go up north and down south, but there, there's nothing wrong with that language. It would indicate, however, a good possibility that Paul visited Jerusalem as well as Antioch. The language, I think, strongly suggests that that, that gone up is, is not Caesarea, but Jerusalem. And from Jerusalem, he went down to Antioch. He spent some time there. He departed and, and he went over all the country of Galatia and, uh, and Phrygia in order strengthening all the disciples. This is the third missionary journey. And I want, I want you to note the missionary journey was to strengthen the disciples. Not to evangelize Ephesus. Not to evangelize Corinth. But to strengthen the disciples. I've, I've said in times past on numerous occasions, that our primary mission is to minister to the body of of Christ first so that the body of Christ then is then equipped to go out and reach the lost and and I'm not talking about the lost as in goats we got to go find the goats and turn them into sheep I'm talking about God's people the lost The missionary activity is to the body of Christ. In verse 24, we're introduced to Apollos. He was born at Alexandria, uh, the city established by Alexander the Great, uh, great city of culture and learning. I, I don't know that we can say enough about Apollos. I, I'm not going to try to exalt Apollos any more than I would Paul. Uh, I will suggest to you, though, that he was a highly educated man. In our terminology today, uh, he would have had the equivalent of a doctorate degree. Not only was he a highly educated man, but he was a skilled speaker. The authorized version translates the word, I think, very, very well. He was an eloquent man. He knew how to speak. I don't think it's derogatory when the Holy Spirit has some say, I am of Paul and others, and I am of Apollos, and some even say, I am of Christ. I mean, why are there divisions among the church at Corinth? That's no more a derogatory statement against Apollos as it is Paul. Apollos, as far as I can see, any place in the Scriptures, was a man of God, a highly educated man, just like Paul. Paul. 
the reason I bring this out is because I believe the Holy Spirit gave us verses 24 through 28 for a very definite reason. And I think much of that reason's missed if we don't first of all remember that Achaia and Priscilla were a married couple apparently dedicated to each other and to the Lord who were very humble folk, tent makers by profession. Their income was not all that great. You'd have to conclude that if, if they are only tent makers, they're not highly educated. Whatever languages they could speak, I, I don't know. Often we uh, attribute the ability to speak more than one language to education. You know, but, but for many an Italian who lives in the north of Italy, it's absolutely necessary that he speak more than one language. He can probably speak uh, Italian, German, French, you know, and as far in, you know, and, and for the French living on the German border, it's mandatory they know at least two languages. In fact, Europe's not anywhere near as big as the United States. In my mind, it'd be difficult for a child to do much. Uh, in a, in a European theater economy without speaking at least a couple of languages, maybe three or four. In my travels while in the Navy, roughly 50 years ago, I visited Spain, Italy, Greece, France. I met many a person who had no more than what we'd call a high school education who could speak four and five, even six languages. You know, maybe not fluently, maybe they couldn't write all those languages, but, uh, but they could communicate in several languages. I have no idea how many Akia and Priscilla knew. I'm led to believe, at least in my mind, they probably spoke Hebrew, Greek, and, and maybe Latin. I don't know. But they were not educated. What they knew of languages, they knew simply because of the environment in which they'd been raised. Apollos now, on the other hand, was from Alexandria. Alexander the Great decided he'd name the city after himself and that he, he would establish a library and a cultural center and a learning center there that would rival anything on the planet. It was out of that that the Septuagint finally came as a translation from Hebrew into Greek because he insisted that a Greek volume be in his library at Alexandria. And here's Apollos, a very eloquent man, a very educated man, and according to the Holy Spirit, he was mighty in the Scriptures, and he came to Ephesus. Now, it's interesting that we know what Paul's experience was on the road to Damascus. We know how God changed the life of Paul. We don't know what happened in the life of Apollos. We know he was a Jew. We know he was a highly educated Jew and an eloquent Jew who was mighty in the Scriptures. And for some reason or other, uh, let me put that in quotes, he came to Ephesus. I think God directed him there. He was instructed in the way of the Lord. It, I mean, it is marvelous what the Holy Spirit says of this, this guy. He was fervent in the Spirit Folks, those are all things that I would, I'd covet the Holy Spirit saying about me. He spoke and He taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. Now once again, I, I ask you to be cautious of the word baptism. I guess with the strong influence of the Presbyterians and the Baptists, we all know what the word means. If, if we're on one side of that fence, it's, well, that's sprinkling. And if we're on the other side of the fence, well, it's immersion and, and everybody seems to take the word and equate it to some kind of a physical act. I do not believe the Holy Spirit's doing that. What Apollo knows is what John taught. And here's an apostle who is identified with the teachings of John the Baptist. He's not teaching baptism by water for repentance in the sense that we hear John teach it. I'm not suggesting that, that wasn't part of what he taught, but what the language is saying is that Apollos was skilled, diligent, 
fervent in the Spirit, teaching the Scriptures, identifying himself with what John knew, which was absolutely nothing short of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. John was beheaded before that ever happened. What he knew was what John taught. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. Now remember, the Jews did not welcome what John taught when they went out. He called them a generation of vipers. He told them that they ought to bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. And then he would baptize them for he baptized with water in order that Christ might be manifest to who? Israel. Israel. John 1.31. That's why John did what he did. But John never saw the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. In prison just before he was beheaded, we hear the anguished cry of a suffering human tell us, art thou the Christ or do we look for another? And yet we know that with love, the Lord Jesus Christ sent him an answer that referred him to the Scriptures. This is what Apollos knows. And he speaks boldly in, in the synagogue, though the very things that he teaches as a doctrine of, of the forerunner of Christ were unacceptable to the Jews. Now once again, if you have the authorized version, it says, when Aquila and, and Priscilla had heard they took Him unto them and expounded unto Him the way of God more perfectly. More perfectly. Now I think we ought to stand in utter amazement at that verse. And here's why. First of all, it's written the way it's written because the translators know that, that protocol requires the husband being mentioned first. But in the Greek, it's Priscilla and Achaia heard. The wife is mentioned first. Now in our days of woke, liberal, feminist, whatever you want to call it, that's not unusual. But let's just bear in mind the language and the time in which this is set. There has to be a reason for her being the first. The reason in verse 18. I can only reach the conclusion in, in verse 26 and, and in all other references in the Bible that Priscilla being named first is because she was the one skilled in the Word. Is that not amazing? So here's a man from, from Alexandria, a highly educated man, fervent in spirit, skillful in the Scriptures, mighty in the Scriptures. I'm told, verse 24, a marvelous speaker. I don't know how Priscilla could speak. I, I don't know whether it was hillbilly, redneck, dialect or what, but I'm certain that that woman and her husband had no educational stature at all compared to Apollos. And I can only say that the Holy Spirit says that here is a skillful, educated, powerful, eloquent man who's willing to sit and be taught by a woman who with her husband was a tent maker. You know, it's interesting that my Bible says not many mighty, not many noble are called. In one way or another, many a person of great stature has come to know Christ through the simplest, most uneducated, unattractive individual. I know it's the working of the Spirit, but I think we lose the grandeur of this passage if we don't see that the Holy Spirit is very carefully laying out for us the fact that we each have a ministry in one another's lives. There is no place that women are demeaned in the Scriptures. No place. In fact, the Bible stands absolutely unique and alone through almost 4,000 years of man's history as exalting woman to her right place. Sure, God declares that it was never His intent, His, His, His purpose, His design that women should exercise continued authority over men, and God has not changed from that position. But we've already seen in Acts that when Paul came to Philippi the first time, he met only with women who had gathered together to worship God. And here we find that it's Priscilla, Priscilla, however you want to say it, not Achaia, not Achilla, 
Aquila, however you want to say it. I'm no good at names. I think you'd probably figured that out by now. Who probably instructed in the way of God more perfectly as though that lowly woman could have anything to teach this mighty man. Now the Holy Spirit is not tearing down or exalting Pr Priscilla, but revealing to us the mighty grace of God that we are a unified family of believers and that God can work through any one of us in the lives of any one of His children. Verse 27, And when He was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive Him, who when He was come, helped them much, listen, listen, which had believed through grace. Through grace. Verse 28, For He mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the Scriptures, that Jesus was the Christ. We're going to stop right there, pick up right there. Next week, Lord willing, thank You for joining us. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, God has come into Your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very thankful for Your Word, for the precious time You've given us to think about it, to study it, to dwell on it, to meditate on it, to share it with one another. We give You all the glory, the honor, and the praise. Filter out that which is foolish, that which is of the flesh, but seal to our hearts only the truth of Your Word that we may grow in grace and knowledge of You. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.